you just see what the, one of these plot i'll just quickly go here so when you increase the biomass as i told when i for second second time when you did the experiment of 18 grams per liter of increase substrate concentration you get the biomass boom but they, we have also studied i don't have report yet after some 45 grams per liter of ferrous sulfur you get toxic effect also in substrate every substrate has a toxic effect so these are some models but yeah we'll come to chloride straight away so we used as per the calculations if you see the biomass if you just focus on this place if you see uh, this 19 uh, 9 9 and 18 grams of chloride if biomass increases but if you see this uh, maintenance energy 9 to 18 it's decreasing it's well low what does it because you have enough food enough everything why will you went to see it it's okay but when it comes to chloride the maintenance would increase you see here the maintenance energy so the increase but it's not it's decrease and if you see this in all of most of people study in batch safe flasks you see the chloride toxic in safe flasks almost you see this is something like 11 to 12 11 gram per liter but at 12 and 13 gram 12 13 you have no growth but same thing if you go at 4 gram per liter in converse reactor you are washed out you cannot so you cannot conclude from the batch studies that converse studies are same thing no it, it has to be different you have to study in different conditions so i read an article it says even i start with 10 gram per liter and i know where you work for 3 years 20 years will get nothing so while doing science as i said also you should know to put your science in the right place so that is more important the the reasons the reasons why uh, this uh, all these things happens and what chloride does it is said that the protons compete because you have sodium potassium protons on the outside of cell and the important feature of this microorganism is all of you know most microorganisms have ph7 inside the cell and outside cell it's also ph7 you know the problem but in this case the ph is 1.5 outside and cell and inside <coughs> so this is very interesting thing and once if you allow and this chloride ions are, high, are highly permeable to the bilipid layers they enter easily and the chloride ions are on the wall and they have a they get they can and all cell wall they 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 make uh, they, they if, if the chloride ions enter and they make inside inside the wall if this chloride ions are inside the wall cl minus cl minus these protons get attracted compared to potassium and sodium so sodium and potassium protons will go faster and once they go in they break the complete ph disturbance the cell disrupts and cell gets trouble there are so many propositions will this effect of chloride there are so many things there are also pm approach moti force issue there so we'll not go in more details so if you see this uh mu max mu max is maximum specific growth rate if you see the values this is 0 gram per liter that means it is not it's not working water it's 9 gram per liter iron supplemented with 0 gram chloride there is no chloride then you, you see the maximum specific growth rate 10 but you see the difference 0.9 0.07 0.09 and 0.7. It's huge. At only two and three gram per liter, but in batch you are seeing that 11 and 12 gram per liter is stored. So these are few values which will give you, and you see the maintenance energy also 30, and maintenance is decreasing. It's not increasing. And some studies of fluoride, we haven't published this, so I didn't. I was not allowed permitted to show all these plots. I know it's safe place, but still. uh this is a collaborative work with lulio technological university so i was not allowed but i just saw the values little bit so which can give you some hints here the maintenance there is a negative value also we are still struggling with the data probably we can get some help later so the maintenance energy here it's increasing it's increasing it's not decreasing in chloride hydrochloride is more toxic because you make hydrochloric acid and you can immediately kill. so but in chloride it's decreasing we found justification but fluoride it's still a question mark we are still on the process to find out a sufficient a suitable reason for that fluoride so with this i conclude questions for me also and for you all of you to think thank you thank you and now we might
some questions from the audience. Uh, I should exercise my right to ask the first yeah, question. Please. <laughs> Uh, see, you said that you are controlling the attachment yeah. of the cells. Yeah. So how do you do that? Uh, we clean the reactor uh, every day. We have it was tough, but uh, what was the issue was uh, we we had one clean reactor, three reactors ready with us, mm -hmm. and uh, the attachment is jerosite first. We made jerosite formation, which is iron precipitate sulfate with some jerosite formal like sodium, ammonium, potassium. They form jerosite forms. Just are quite sticky, they stick with the cells together. So, hydrochloric acid, constant hydrochloric acid was used to clean the reactor every day. Purely hydrochloric acid. No, that is true. But yeah. you see, um, I see there is a relationship between the attachment and the chloride concentration. Attachment is, that was, that, that, that discussion I made with attachment is different and chloride concentration is different. True, but when you are passing the chloride, yeah. uh, the chloride also inhibits the attachment. But it didn't happen like that. I didn't have any uh, yeah, that is, in that? yeah, we did that. Okay. We did that also. Uh, we, it is much easier job for us. <laughs> if we, we, we first tried, because everyone wants an easy way. Because every day cleaning a reactor for a student or a, for a scientist or anyone with hydrochloric acid, putting a mask in his face, it's dangerous, it's dangerous for this difficult job. That's also fluid. But what happens is these microorganisms, they are very sticky because they stick to the minerals very hard also. A lot of study from, I think, from Germany, one group, uh, they have done a lot of work. They find very, very, they, are, they never, they are make, they are, and they are also well known, they have three mechanisms uh, defined, well defined. They make EPS layer on the surface. Yeah. See, biofilm formation is yeah. an obvious. Uh, yeah, they are very strong with that. That's, that's so, and in fact, chloride might interfere in the. I am telling you, we try to silane also. I tell you, I tried three different things. Mm -hmm. Silane, we put silane inside, and we treated to silane, and we tried. Didn't work out. We even tried to put some beads inside, some plastic, plastic, different type of plastic. We tried, let them attach on this so that, but they are never happy to attach on the walls. Because due to the centrif probably, sorry, probably due to the centrifugal uh, force, they are going, uh, and uh, even with baffles, but that is not allowing them to do the job in, in, the, in between. Instead. Probably there is more engineering aspect to be understood than that. Yes? Yeah, um, but uh, the batch growth and the continuous systems have a different same way. The batch and the continuous systems have a difference. You said in a batch chloride was toler tolerated up to 11 ppm. Yeah. Even in our reactors, when we were uh, assessing chloride inhibition, mm -hmm. we found uh, right up to 5 or 6 gram per liter, there was an improvement in K value. There was an improvement yeah. in K value, and then the inhibition started. But so, how many days experiment was this? Actually, at each uh, uh, steady state, we kept it for in batch? Five, uh, three weeks. No, uh, yeah, in batch, we continued for uh, a total of three months. Okay. Yeah, for me it was only one or two days. Yeah, but for continuous systems, yeah. when we tried to decrease the HRT, or yeah. dilution yeah. Yeah. Uh, then there was a washout even at two, three grams per liter, four grams yeah. per liter. Yeah, it also happened to us, so two, three grams washout. So it out. happens. Uh, but if, 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 it will have happened also that for two grams per liter initially, but if we stop the reactor to enter it to, to, and wait to adapt a little bit, adaptation worked out. Actually, this is what happens in attached growth. The adaptation would be better. Yeah. So that's why attached uh, uh, films True. will always be able to contribute much, much more. Mm. Mm. And then there is no inhibition because of continuous dilution rate. It's yeah. a continuous process. So the attached growth is not uh, getting affected by any no, but then there are critical, critical levels of attachment out there. There is a yes. okay. amount of biofilm that you There will not be any penetration yeah. inside the film. So it's a good thing. I need to start here. Yeah. Yes. Uh, actually, I have a question. It's a little different from what you are trying to do, yeah. but it's a little related as well. Yeah. Uh, see, uh, there is another problem uh, mm -hmm. of uh, salinity of soil. Uh, that's totally a different issue. Uh, but of course, uh, I mean, we have a uh, problem with chloride ions. Yeah. We have problem with uh, sodium ion, primarily because sodium chloride is the the uh, the key component or key compound which makes the soils saline. Mm. And when the plants have to, being a plant scientist, um, mm. uh, for me, uh, the challenge with the thing we are working on is how to make plants uh, grow in uh, soil which is very saline. Mm. And there are different ways of doing it. We have mm. been trying to study. Uh, we are trying to study. Uh, different genes that are involved in chloride and mm -hmm. uh, chloride channels and there are some uh, sodium toxicity. Primarily sodium is the uh, the most important uh, mm -hmm. thing. 
so is uh, I mean is this kind of a thing what you are going to do here? Uh, can some modifications to this be applied into the agricultural or uh, into the, the the troubled soils? I mean the way uh, uh, here it has been uh, shown. I mean uh, so that it's not made available to uh, the plant somehow. Yeah, uh, I think uh, the, uh, the soil, it, it, uh, I don't know, I mean, I'm not that much uh, expert, but I, what, I, what my thought goes to is, unless until we trap the chlorides somehow from the process water, we cannot think about that. So one thing could be done is, if you can, uh, if you can uh, dechloride or chloride removal from the uh, water and then pump the water to the agricultural that is quite actually, difficult part. Actually the is it the soil, soil or water? It's basically the soil which is saline. Okay, this is not, not the water. Yeah, so, so it's not, it's very difficult, I mean we cannot do anything with the soil, it's all yeah. we put any water, any kind of water, it's going to turn saline and then uh, it's uh, it's available uh, in the vicinity of the root system. Mm. No, I, I, I'm unable to, I need yeah. to, but yeah, we but can I come mean, back, I mean, fine. Something uh, can, uh, like, I can come back, we right. can talk, yeah, um, sure, sure. Uh, probably uh, we will get some hints. Because once you start thinking, we'll get some ideas. Sure. Yeah, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Gahan, for a nice lecture. Thank you. Uh, so, uh, you can still ask these two yeah. gentlemen a few questions during the tea time. Uh, I would like to thank the organizers for giving me an opportunity to be here, and I'll hand over the mic to them back. Thank you very much. I think let's do this. So I'm thankful to the organizers for giving me this opportunity to chair this session. And uh, in this session, thanks. there are two invited talks, one by Dr. Tarun Khan of uh, AFRI and by Dr. Akhil Agrawal. So, uh, I, I request them to take half an hour each. And, uh, I was somehow under the impression that this lecture was from Dr. Krishna Mohan. So, I invite Dr. Tarun Kant from AFRI Jodhpur to deliver his talk on an argument in favor of GM technology for guaranteed food security and environmentally sustainable agriculture. I'm sorry, I do not have the uh, you to go ahead with your introduction. Right. Thank you. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chairman. <coughs> thank you. Uh, first of all, I'd like to thank the organizers at the very onset for uh, it's a big honor to come here, to stand before you all, and to be able to talk about uh, the subject that I just love. All the dignitaries, the esteemed the university, the IS university, the faculty members, and the students. I see a lot of young faces. And I feel uh, this uh, GM technology is uh, pretty much a buzzword, and uh, a lot of you must be interested in, uh, in what the GM technology is. You know about it. You know about the controversies about it. And then I just want to say something, why we should not be so much afraid about it. So that's what I'm going to talk about today. But let me start by drawing a tangent. Uh, at a very different end, and let me start by something else, an introduction I would like to, or a background on, uh, and slowly I'll come to this uh, topic of GM. Uh, this talk is not going to be very, very, uh, uh, I should say, full of a lot of uh, jargons and all. I just want to talk about uh, a misunderstood technology, and a uh, lot of uh, hyperbole about it, and a lot of uh, criticism about it. And, but the technology which is a lot of scope. Uh, go back uh, to about a little bit of the environmental concerns. Uh, it's a modern day life, the, the society, the consumer society we live in. Uh, what are the major concerns that 
really occupy us or bother us. The first is energy. The most important thing that without energy nothing can happen, without energy no development can take place, without energy no industry can be there. Uh, the way we live all depends on energy. So energy is something very important. Then of course the environment. The most important thing which we are all concerned about, environment talks are there, a uh, lot of talk about climate change is there. And when we talk of environment, we all know it's air and water, the two most important things. And then the third thing that concerns us all is the food that we eat. So let me talk about energy first. See, these are some statistics which I have gathered from different sources, very reliable sources like IUCN, mostly the International Union of the, the IUCN you all know. Uh, so uh, the FAO and IUCN, I have uh, taken these information from there. The energy use will continue to grow in another 35% by 2020. So four years from now, uh, there will be a spike in energy use and it will just grow. Uh, and there will be another 35% increase. So more energy is required. Right? We all know that. Commercial and residential energy use is the second most important and the most rapidly growing area. We are using energy. It used to be industry that used to be, the, is still the biggest consumer, but household is next to that. And it consumes 29% of the global energy. So it's a big number, 29% of the whole energy is used by the household. And that contributes to 21% of the resultant CO2 emissions. We don't realize this, that the households are also polluting our environment. A 32% increase in vehicle ownership. I mean, we all see, we are all buying cars. There used to be a single car in a family. Now there are, the number of cars has increased to the number of people in the family. That's how it's happening now. And this will, this trend is this is a trend, and it will go. It's going to, uh, I mean, go up exponentially. And at the same time, the mo uh, the motor vehicle kilometers are projected to increase by 40 percent, and the global air travel is projected to triple in the same period. So in the next four years, I mean, it's going to go like I mean, recklessly high. This is energy, but energy is linked to the air, the air and the water that we breathe and that we drink and that we use and that our agriculture uses. So let's talk about energy a little bit, about uh, air. About, uh, air. Uh, an average person breathes around 7 liters of air per minute, which means around 12,000 liters of air each day. So that's how much we need. And inhaling an air pollution takes uh, one to two years of our whole life. We are just breathing. I mean, if we just uh, sum it up, it comes to be one to two years of total pollution, only pollution if we are breathing. According to the Lancet Journal, air pollution caused by waiting in traffic increases the chance of death by cardiovascular problems. So not just pulmonary, but also cardiovascular problems. Outdoor air, air pollution ranks uh, in the top 10 uh, killers on Earth, and the pollution uh, is estimated to cause uh, over 5 lakh deaths every year in India. And uh, in 2013, a report by the Global Burden of Disease, there is an organization which says that the outdoor air pollution which was the fifth largest killer in India. And this, I mean, this was 2013. And according to WHO, Delhi has bypassed, has surpassed Beijing in terms of the pollution level. And that's why you all know the odd and even formula was tried and tested in Delhi. The most polluted cities in the world. Uh, so, I mean, these are all facts. I mean, I don't want to sound negative, but this is these are the facts that of a society we live in, of a modern, of a very elite society we think we live in, but this is what are the burdens right now that we have to deal with every day. And by 2050, that is not very far away, uh, the six, billion, 6 million people will die per year due to air pollution itself. So I think this will be the biggest killer uh, if things go the way they are right now. And then... Uh, the third aspect that I wanted to tell you about was water. I mean, this is something very interesting. You'll love this. 70% of Earth's surface is covered with water. And, and we are all happy about it. I mean, 70%, a lot of water is there. Right? 70% is a very big number. So it's all, 70% of us is made of water. And so 70% is the magical number. We all are happy. 70%, nothing to worry. There's a lot of water. But do you know that three, uh, less than 3% of the world's water is fresh? Only 3% of this, 70% water, total water, only 3% is drinkable water. So, that, I mean, 
brings brings it down to just three uh, percent. But then, do you know that of this 2.5 percent is frozen in Antarctic and in the in the glaciers? So we are just left with 0.5 percent of fresh water. Total water available on Earth only 0.5 percent is available to whatever we want to do with, whether we want to drink it, whether we want to do our agriculture with, for whatever we want to do for our our living. We just have 0.5 percent of the total water available on the planet Earth. So this is something which is uh, will will raise eyebrows and which can uh, is something a point we should understand always. And we are polluting water faster than the nature can recycle it and purify it because nature has a way of recycling things. But we are polluting it at a very faster rate. You, you know the, the the data that I've shown on air and on on energy and on uh, on. Uh, the things that I've shown, you can see that this is, has direct consequences on uh, the water resource, the most important resource for life to be present on Earth. And more than one billion people still do not have access to fresh water. We know that. And excess use of water contributes to global water stress. The problem is that water we feel, we take it for granted. The water is a free thing. Like everything is free. We, are, we, should, we have a free air to breathe. We have water is a free commodity available to us, and I call it commodity now, because water is free from nature, but infrastructure needed to deliver it to us is expensive. We get it, we open the tap, and we get water. And that water that we get in our taps, which we take it for granted, that is something very expensive. The technology required to bring it to our taps is something very expensive, and that's only 0.5% of the total water. And the third thing, the food. Now, this, my whole talk will concentrate around food, but everything is connected. That's why I, I had shown you all those, uh, those figures. Now, we all know that 1.3 billion tons of food is wasted every year, while almost another 1 billion people go undernourished, and another 1 billion go hungry. Overconsumption of food is detrimental, we all know that. And 1.5 billion people globally are overweight and obese. And the food sector accounts for around 30% of the world's total energy. So 20, uh, 1 percent was the 29% the was the household, and the food sector uh, accounts for 30% of the world's total energy consumption, and it leads to 22% of the total greenhouse gas emissions. So these are very big contributors. Together, they contribute about half of the pollution that we are having right now. So let me um, ask you a very uh, funny question: What if one day? There is nothing to eat. I mean, it'll it'll sound very bizarre. That how is it possible that we don't have anything to eat one day? Can it be possible? I mean, I was showing that there is over there is people are wasting food, and uh, uh, I mean people are uh, overweight because of food and uh, food habits. But what if one day we have? Is this a looming danger? Well, f friends, believe me, this is a real pertinent issue which is coming up very slowly and is going to be a reality very soon. Why? Because the projection says, the IUCN says that by 2050, if consumption, if the current consumption rates and the current production patterns are there, the way we are producing, um, we are doing agriculture and all, we are producing food, and the way we are consuming it, and at the same time, the population which is supposed to rise up to 9.6 billion by 2050, that is 960 crores, the population of Earth. We will need three planets to sustain our way of living. This is not me saying that, this is IUCN has come up with. You can open the website. The last year they had uh, the uh, the World Environment Day, which was celebrated in, on uh, 5th of June, and the title was uh, 7 billion people, and we need three, um, I mean, we need three planets to uh, if we go the way we are going right now, we'll require three planets. We just have one Earth. We cannot create three planets. So by 2050. So friends, what is the biggest pressure? The single most important pressure on Earth and consequently on the environment. I mean, I'd like to ask the audience, what is the biggest pressure on Earth right now? Anyone? Very true. Population. So the population is the biggest pressure, and that's why everything is happening, because of this population pressure. Let me show you a very interesting graph. This graph, uh, we have uh, uh, population uh, on this uh, side, 
you can see uh, in two, four, six uh, billions, and here this is a uh, batch of 50, 50 years. So uh, starting from 1850, if we start, if you look at this graph, this is how the population trend has been on Earth. 1815, uh, 1850 to 1900s, that is the time, um, I mean, uh, Rani Lakshmi was there, so that's the starting point. And 1900s, the turn of the last century, uh, this is how the population was, around, say, 0.2 billion, and that increased to around, uh, say, 0.3 billion, probably, uh, or maybe even less than that, by in, in, uh, in 150 year period. In the next 50 years, by the time we got our independence, 1950s, 1947 we got it. So by that time, the population of Earth was, it has just increased by four times, fourfold increase. You can see that exponential pattern already emerging by 1950s. And then by 2000, you can see it was around 7 point something billion. Just see this trend. It's very scary. But what are the projections? What are the projections? What will happen in the next 50 years? Not, not even 50 years. What will happen by 2050? It is expected that we will be around 9.6, that is 960 crores on Earth. And beyond that, well, things are going to collapse. I mean, this is an artist's uh, uh, interpretation of the whole thing, but this is how it looks like. It looks like we are riding a population tsunami. Things are just going to collapse after that. We just cannot sustain the way we are doing agriculture, the way we are consuming, the way things are going on right now. It just cannot go on and on like this. It is going to end somewhere and this is the trend. And the United Nations says that the global food production has to be doubled by 2050 to what it is today. Doubling up, it's a very big task. I mean, it's not a joke. Doubling up the production by 2050. And we just have 34 years left with us. In 34 years, we have to double up the production to match this growing population. So, what is to be done? I mean, I've painted a very bleak picture, I'm sorry, but what has to be done? Do we have solutions with us? Can our agriculture, the way we do our agriculture today, does it have solutions, the technology available with it? The modern agriculture definitely has solutions. A lot of research has been done and, but the thing is, are we sure the way agriculture has progressed, we can match that figure of doubling of the agricultural produce? Can we produce more food for this rising population? The answer is yes, to some extent, but there is a big caveat. We have to pay a very heavy price for, for that doubling up with the way we do agriculture right now. And what price? This price. You all know. The agricultural fields are overladen, the burden, they are burdened with agrochemicals. The chemical pesticides, the fertilizers, all disastrous and dangerous chemicals, they have been used over and over for the years now. And that's why we have been able to match up the agricultural production. But the result has been toxic environmental overloads of these dangerous chemicals. Well, here is a trade. I mean, you may be wondering what a train is doing in this uh, presentation. Well, friends, this is this train is the Abogar Jodhpur passenger train passing through Batinda and Bikane. And this train is known as Cancer Train. Many of you must be knowing it. It has been on TV many a times. Now, but this, what, it, what this train does is it brings people from Punjab to Bikane where there is a cancer research institute which they do charity and they do treatment of uh, cancer patients. And this uh, train is packed with cancer patients coming from Punjab. Why? Because, because of contaminated water. Uh, because of contaminated water, excessive use of pesticides, herbicides, and chemicals, and high crop yield they have got, but they have paid the price by having <coughs> cancer. Almost every other household, the, fam the farming family, the farming fraternity, they have they are suffering from cancer in Punjab. There was, an, uh, there was a study in 2004 by the Center for Science and Environment in Delhi and they found high residues of pesticide in the blood of the farmers of Batinda and Rupa district. So what next? Any solutions do we have? Well, solutions are there, but are we ready yet? Do we have the mindset to accept this solution that I am trying to tell you here? 
they are not ready. Most of the people, most of the common man, I should say, uh, the the armed janta, I should say, they are not ready for this. I guess. I'm talking of in, uh, the intelligent plants, the plants that can fight pests, that can survive abiotic stresses, that can have high yield and lot more. Yes, I'm talking about the GMOs. The GMOs, as we all know, are nothing but the genetically modified organisms or the transgenics. We all know about the BT cotton, which is a success story already. And all the cotton that is coming right now in India is all BT. And then they, we had BT brinjal, and there was so much of hue and cry in the country, and it has, the government has put a moratorium on the uh, on the commercial release of BT brinjal because they want to do some, they want to be sure uh, that uh, nothing is wrong with it. So the question remains: Are genetically modified crops safe? Are they safe? That is the pertinent question running in everybody's mind. The technology is already controversial, as you all know. So much of uh, debates are going on in the country, in the newspapers, in the science magazines. Then the question is, why are we paranoid about GM crops? Why? First of all, we are afraid. Most of us don't want to accept uh, GM technology. And uh, I mean, so many people uh, keep asking me, I mean, as uh, in, I've faced this question a lot, that why GM? And then the question is, why are we paranoid? Why are we afraid of it? Well, first of all, the anxiety of the unknown. This is a normal psychology. Because the anxiety of the unknown. We, we are going into a territory which is sort of unknown, unfamiliar. And then people call it unnatural. This important term, unnatural, I have put it, I have highlighted it with inverted commas. <laughs> unnatural is, are the GM plants or the GM crop that people produce, are they producing plants which are unnatural? So the fear of unfamiliar and unnatural is the biggest anxiety people have. And the concerns about health and environmental impact. Naturally, I mean, these are issues. We are paranoid about GM food, particularly because of the pseudoscience. The propagation of pseudoscience has been instilled and that has, produced, that has caused fear in the consumers. And what pseudoscience is that? I'll come to that. People feel that this is going to do something. If they eat a uh, BT brinjal or uh, they eat something, then it's going to cause some harm in their body. And the consequences, the fact that the anti-GM lobby, like the Greenpeace and the GM Free India, there are a lot of people uh, are working against the GM. Um, the fact is that the anti-GM lobby is positioning themselves as the good guys. They are presenting data. I have attended a seminar uh, a couple of days back, a couple of years back, I guess. They invited me to talk. Uh, and I talked in favor, and that was uh, organization uh, by the, uh, this uh, the seminar was organized by the GM Free India. And I mean, I was surprised to see the posters they had uh, everywhere in the that, in that seminar venue. There were posters hanging in the seminar venue, and uh, they had shown photoshopped uh, tomatoes. Uh, they had a, a, a tomato was there with a leg of a. Uh, chicken uh, and, a, and a, a tomato with a uh, face of a fish, and trying to tell people that I mean they have put genes from animal sources into the into the plants, and then you are I mean feeding on non veg. I mean this is all it's all bogus. This is all cheap. Uh, uh, I should say uh, publicity, uh, showing Photoshop uh, posters of I mean this is nothing scientific. This is all pseudoscience, uh, making impact, uh, and. There is uh, this in the UC Davis, University of California Davis, there is a World Food Center and uh, the founder of the Genetic Literacy pro um, Project is there going on uh, right now uh, by according to John Antan of this project. They are exploiting people's lack of sophistication about these issues and perpetuating pseudoscience. That's how I have seen happening and this is happening everywhere because there is a big lobby behind it. I mean, you can understand that. A lot of if, if pl plants become intelligent, a lot of industry things will come down. Nobody wants that to happen. So, then who should we believe? With this background, who should we finally believe? Where should we look for the answers? Well, friends, FAO, the most respected and the reputed organization. According to the FAO's SOFA report, it's the state of the food and agriculture report, it comes out, I mean, once in a while. The last report came out in 2003 and 4, and uh, they had done a survey. And according, you can this uh, report is available online in public domain. Anybody can go and see exactly. I've just cut and I've, I've copied and pasted here what is written here from this report. That thus far in those countries where transgenic crops have been grown, 
there have been no vi verifiable reports of them causing any significant health or environmental concern. There was a, a concern a couple of years back uh, when I was doing my PhD in 99, uh, 97 to 99, uh, that period I was working on uh, GM, and uh, there was a concern about monarch butterfly that it will be exterminated, but nothing of that kind happened. It's been 20 years now, nothing is of that kind has happened. Pests have not become uh, resistant to Bt. And some evidence of HT, that is uh, herbicide tolerance weeds have emerged, but super weeds, as they said, super weeds will be there and they will invade the agricultural crops and all, nothing has happened so far. In the countries where they are growing, like in US and in, in China, even in India, a lot of uh, crop is uh, GM already. Then let me show you some uh, quickly very uh, recent developments and some very uh, uh, recent findings. A recent US Supreme Court decision conquered that genetically modified alpha alpha is safe. After a lot of uh, work they had put in, after a lot of uh, exercise they did, and this was published in the Forbes magazine, one of the most reputed uh, references. Uh, and uh, in 2013 only this report came out. The USDA has done a very thorough review and they have allowed genetically modified sugar beets to be grown. 2012, a meta-analysis of 12 long-term studies and 12 multi-generation studies was published in a very reputed journal, the Journal of Food and Chemical Toxicology. And this journal is again available online uh, under open access and you can have a look at this journal and it says that the GM plants are nutritionally equivalent to their non-GM counterparts that can be safe uh, in food and feed. And according to an independent organization, Bio45, they have uh, done hundreds of such studies and they have found that there have been no harmful effects of the edible uh, GM. More studies are there. Uh, a more comprehensive study on the GM uh, was by the UC Davis Department of Animal Science and Genetics, uh, geneticist Ellison Van Eninem and uh, Young. They have reviewed 29 years of livestock productivity, 29 years of studies this is. And uh, they have uh, done that uh, they found that nothing is wrong uh, with the, the genetically engineered uh, fodder that was fed to the animals. The results are published in the Animal Science Journal. You can have a look at this as well. 2014 this came out. Uh, so, there are more. I mean, this is now becoming a routine. We are getting more and more reports out. Nature, 2013, there was a special edition on GMOs. Uh, this is available, this whole uh, issue is available online for free. You can have a look. Uh, in this uh, uh, issue number uh, 497, they say that the GM crops have increased the agricultural productivity by more than 98 billion US dollars. That is equal to over 6,27,600 crore of rupees. And have saved an estimated of 473 million kilograms of pesticides from being sprayed. Because of introduction of GM crop, this amount of this much million kilograms of pesticides was not used. So this is a spin-off benefit of use of GM technology. Not just GM is doing good, but as a result of uh, using GM, uh, people are able to s uh, save our environment from the use of the, uh, the pesticides and the other harmful agrochemicals. 2015, very recently, last year only, in the May 21 issue of the Newsweek magazine, this magazine was on genetic modification. Available for free, you can have a look at it. It says that there was an article that carries GM scientists could save the world from hunger if we let them. So, but I mean, the GM, the, the lobby is so strong, uh, not letting uh, this thing happen. But if it, they are, the GM scientists are allowed to do this, they can save. They have the technology, they have the know how to do it. So, what's stopping us? The notion that genetic modification is unnatural. And the GM food is strength in food. Finally, we come back to the same issue. So, we don't want anything unnatural, but is it really unnatural? Well friends, let me uh, just show you, uh, I mean, this is a historic uh, sort of uh, uh, slide. The flavor saver tomato was the first commercial uh, thing that came out, uh, 32 years back it came out. And uh, this was a transgenic plant produced by men, introduced into the market and consumed by people. It is, being, it is, it is already there. It increases the shelf life of tomato, right? So flavor saver tomato was there, 32 years back, man produced it, introduced it, and this happened 32 years back, but do you all know that nature is making GMOs from the time immemorial, from eternity? I mean, this is happening in nature all the time. And when man is trying to do it, people are saying that it's wrong, we are doing something unnatural. 
Well, if you see this, this is a classic uh, tree of life. We all know this. We have all seen it in textbooks. And we see that life started protests and it then over it evolved into multicellular and uh, the, the way we all know that. I, mean, I won't go into the details. But what it tells about is that there is a unidirectional flow of genes from the the parents to the offsprings. The, the gene flow, the DNA flow from in nature is unidirectional. And that is how things have evolved. And the genes pass on from the parents to their offsprings, to their offsprings and so on and so forth. And this is known as vertical gene transfer. We all know the theory and, and on the ba based on the theory of vertical gene transfer is this classic figure we all have seen in all textbooks is based on that VGD or vertical gene transfer. So let me tell you, there are now proofs coming out because of the next generation sequencing technology that has, uh, is available to the scientists and a lot of work is going on that you shake any branch of this tree and you'll find out that new and new evidences for transfer of gene between the different branches is happening. Not just unidirectional, but horizontally as well. Gene is being transferred. And that has happened in nature, that has happened in the past and it's happening right now and it's happened always. So if you look at this, this is what is exactly happening and has happened. So this is an old theory. Now this is the new theory that there is gene transfer between different branches of this tree of life. The genes have transferred not just between different plants, unrelated species, unrelated genera, but between divisions, between kingdoms, between plants and animals, there have been, there have been transfer of genes. And that has happened in nature. I'll quickly uh, go through, I don't know how much time I've left. Just, I'll, I'll try to conclude. I'll just show you some examples quickly of these proofs which have come out in the recent past of natural genetic modification being done by nature. Trying to tell you that nothing is wrong in GM when we are trying to do horizontal gene transfer because genetic engineering is nothing but horizontal gene transfer. Nature is doing it already. Here are some of the examples. The vertical gene transfer we all know. I mean I've already talked about it but here are some examples that how widespread it is. The horizontal neochrome gene transfer from LD to fern. Otherwise, it's not possible. I mean, the, there is a this uh, pigment neochrome we all know, and this pigment. Uh, I mean, when there is scarcity of light, algae uses it, and then ferns use it, but nothing in between. How can it? Uh, is it I mean, people. Uh, were, uh, this was a big puzzle. But how is it possible that uh, a gene for neochrome has gone from algae into uh, into ferns, and they have not. Uh, come out that the ferns have not evolved neochrome on their own, but they have got it from ferns. There is a paper of horizontal gene transfer published in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Science, another very reputed uh, I mean, uh, reference, uh, anything published in PNAS is I mean, as good as, uh, I mean, that is the bottom line. So the horizontal gene transfer of eruptive chimeric pho uh, photoreceptor from bryophyte to fern. I mean, uh, th there are papers uh, available, you can uh, go online and see all this is available in the public domain. Then another very interesting thing came out recently in 2015, last year itself, uh, the sweet potato is a natural GMO. We all eat sweet potato. Nobody says don't eat sweet potato, we all eat it. And you'll be surprised that uh, in this very uh, cover page of PNAS uh, in uh, 2015, it is on sugar beet. And what uh, this uh, uh, people from uh, Kin Dettel from uh, Gent University, they, they were working on metagenomic analysis and they were trying to study some viral disease and they found out that agrobac they found that in, one, in 291 cultivated sweet potato cultivars, they found the same stretch of DNA that has got integrated into the genome of the, uh, uh, the sweet potato uh, over somewhere uh, during evolutionary process and they found this tDNA uh, in all these. So if it was one um, uh, agrobacterium strain, uh, one of the uh, cultivars was having it, then it would have been questionable. But 291 strains having the same stretch of a bacterial uh, gene uh, inside the plant gene, that is because of the horizontal gene transfer. And very interestingly, we all know about uh, the grafting. We have uh, the stock and we have the cyan. And they found out the, uh, the recently in uh, science this paper came out and that when there is grafting, 
there is transfer of genetic material between the two, the donor and the, the new material that has come up. So there is a gene transfer that takes place in grafting as well, which was unknown. Not just that, there is inter-division gene transfer. This is an animal. This is a sea slug. And this is a sea, sl a sea slug which lives in the, uh, in the sea and it does photosynthesis. An animal doing photosynthesis. Where did it get the genes from? It has got the genes and this has now been proven. Another paper came out in uh, PNAS in 2008. Uh, beautiful paper to read that the nuclear genome of this uh, for oxygenic photosynthesis, the PSBO from an algae has got into this and rest of the genes are coming from its own to complete the photosynthesis. So this is a reality. Uh, an animal which has taken genes from the plant kingdom. Not just that, there are other examples of animals, uh, uh, this, uh, this uh, P. aphid, which is green in color, it has got this color because of carotenoids which it has ingested. So this is another example. Similarly, uh, in the butterflies, there has been horizontal gene transfer from wasp because wasps, they uh, capture the caterpillars of the uh, butterflies and they lay their eggs and introduce a virus which make the, uh, the caterpillar paralyzed. Just five more minutes. I'll just conclude. And uh, they found that some of the caterpillars, they were able to resist the infection because they had the genes from the wasp. It's a non-mating population. How the gene went in there? That is the horizontal gene transfer. And the question next is, what about humans? Have we faced horizontal gene transfer? Well, the answer is yes. We are also not untouched with HGD. According to Chris Petal, this paper came out last year only, 2015, in Genome Biology. We are not completely human says because we just have DNA from, we have 145 genes that have jumped from bacteria, from other single cell organisms, and from viruses that have made home into the human genome. So even the human beings are, you can say, unnatural because we also have genes from outside. So when this is happening in nature, then what's wrong? <coughs> Basically, genetic engineering is nothing but facilitated horizontal gene transfer. Horizontal gene transfer is already going on. When we do it in the lab, it's facilitated uh, gene transfer. And I don't think there is anything wrong with it. And um, we, sh we have to accept it. More and more proofs are coming in. So, let me conclude by just telling you very quickly, the last slide, we are riding a population tsunami. Natural resources are limited. Agricultural production has to be doubled up by the next 35 years. The current agricultural practices are dangerous, non-sustainable and poisoning the environment. The GM food and crops have not shown any ill effect so far. This is what the, the research, long-term research is proving. The GM crops have been developed, have helped reduce the use of agrochemicals. When we have, wherever it has been used, the use of dangerous agrochemicals, the amount used was uh, reduced. And nature is doing, producing GMOs all the time. So why not we also embrace and we accept this technology as a viable technology for a sustainable future, sustainable agriculture for the growing human needs. That's it, friends. And uh, that's a very old photograph 20 years back. Uh, I was working at Purdue University and for my PhD. And this is the rice, GM rice that I produced. And I'm trying to water them. So, I mean, technology is there for so many years. So many years. The only thing is that the acceptability has to be there. And only then things can progress from there. And I hope the day will come. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Khan, for such a thought-provoking and absorbing talk. But before I open it for discussions, I am again exercising my rights as a chairperson. Uh, I will be failing in my duty if I don't introduce, uh, in some formal words, Dr. Khan, but in a very short manner. He did his uh, master's from University of Botany, Rajasthan University, so he's son of soil. Later on, he took Rockefeller's Foundation PhD scholarship, which is a very prestigious scholarship to go to Purdue for his PhD. And in our environmental engineering, Purdue University every year holds a conference that is supposedly the best in the world on industrial waste treatment. So it's a great place. 
Then they did this postdoctoral from University of Cambridge. I remember 1996, I wrote to Stuart Ferguson for some of his papers on Thyosera pentatropha. And he immediately sent uh, quite a few papers. So that was one of the universities where uh, some work was going on. So he has great credentials and is currently a scientist E at uh, AFRI. So, uh, I mean, it was interesting really to uh, look at your views. I just want to add a small comment about the cancer trade. In some of the areas where from a lot of people are turning up of cancer from Punjab to Bikaner, it has been going on for more than two decades now. Uh, in some of these areas, there is some radioactivity also reported, which is probably exacerbating the problems. So that is another angle we can go ahead and uh, think about. But uh, I, I just sum up what he said was, biomimetics perhaps is one of the safest ways of going further with GM experimentation. So that is how I would like to sum up. Now the uh, house is open for discussions. Any questions from the audience? Yeah. Can I make a comment? Yes, yes sir. sir. Not a question. Yes. See, the problem with the GMOs is because of the unintended side effects, which we cannot predict because the technologies that we were using were very gross, like bombarding them with the particles and something like that. <clears throat> but now we have systems like CRISPR-Cas, right. exactly. uh, where your precision of insertion is so good that uh, there is no unintended effect if you plan your yeah. So I think it is a, uh, we are in an interesting time uh, that we should proceed with the GMO without any uh, fear of getting an unintended effect. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, uh, the CRISPR gene editing, I think, is something which is going to be the buzzword for the coming uh, several decades, I guess, and that's going to take us into very safe GMs. That's, I'm pretty sure about that. so why not for the food qualities to अच्छा करने के लिए production को बढ़ाने के लिए इसका opposition क्यों है? That was not मतलब better नहीं मेरे को समझ नहीं आया। नहीं actually it's the opposition is because as I said it's the people have propagated pseudo science I mean it's sort of there are a lot of agencies which have been misguiding because you see it's very complicated it won't be right for me to at this forum to uh, blame a particular organization or something, but I can just say that uh, people have been exposed to the darker side and have not been told about the benefits. Anything has two sides, every coin has two sides. Mm -hmm. Definitely, there should be some demerits with every technology we use, whatever we do, there are demerits, but people don't know about the, uh, the merits of it. And uh, the, the demerits have been so much exaggerated, as I was telling you, I attended a, a seminar where they had a poster, not just one, so many posters, with, which were very funny to look, and people were saying, see, I mean, what scientists are doing with us, I mean, they uh, were, uh, I mean, playing with the uh, sentiments of people, playing on this uh, vegetarian, non-vegetarian card, things like this, has taken a toll on, on all this, on progression of science. What I say is, well, let's let at least let scientists come up and do research and uh, uh, come up with technology because I'm telling you one day uh, that this is what we all know about when uh, a person, howsoever, uh, I mean, if, if there's a person who is on the deathbed and he needs to be fed, he's a vegetarian, he has been a vegetarian uh, all his yes. life and he has to be fed, say, something of animal origin, he will go ahead, yes. he will be injected in, uh, to survive. Yeah. So the day when we will be uh, required to survive, when, uh, when, because that situation uh, nobody is able to pictureize, but the day when that happens, uh, when we are towards a catastrophic uh, uh, scenario, I think that's when people will start accepting. Mm -hmm. But it shouldn't be too late then. So the research should at least keep going on, trials should keep coming in, and uh, the data should be generated all these years as has been generated in the meta-analysis is happening right now, uh, world over. And I, I think with this kind of um, study, uh, people with time will start understanding that GM is not that bad. Yeah.
सर यू कैन कोरिलेट दिस विद द गवर्नमेंट प्रोजेक्ट्स के साथ जैसे आप जोड़े और अवेयरनेस बढ़ाएं और जैसा कि बताएं कि पेस्टिसाइड इतना मिलियन रिड्यूस हो जाएगा right. अगर हम जीएम को करते हैं तो इट्स अ ग्रेट बेनिफिट टू द होल सोसाइटी कि आप फूड प्रोडक्शन में इतना अच्छा करें और वही आज का कंसर्न है उसके अलावा कोई और कंसर्न है भी थैंक यू सो मच थैंक यू सो मच थैंक यू and uh, there are reports in nature and pns where they are saying that it is not uh, bad for the health i think it's better that we should also aware the people regarding how they are made because we are only telling them that what are the benefits or what are the it's not bad but uh, most of the common people they don't know how they are produced that's why the opposition basically they are able to make up the thing that they we are putting in some non vegetarian in this or something like that if we can make this thing Through conference or through some source, how they are being prepared well in the normal common man's mind, then I think this opposition can be taken care of, and it will be better. Then we will be able to produce more and more of GMOs rather than. Yeah, it's actually uh, if you if you remember a couple of years back when the uh, BT Brinjal debate was going on, the way it was reported in the news. And somebody, uh, I went to, uh, I was meeting somebody, uh, just like a common man, and he was saying uh, there was a person visiting the lab, uh, and uh, he was, uh, uh, I mean, a person who was trying to do something in the lab, and he said that the news is coming in. Usme, my mother says that she will never touch brinjal again in life because she never knows. So that is the kind of things, uh, exaggeration of facts, yeah, over exaggeration. Yeah, that, that is what we have to do because uh, I think if we'll just talk in terms of science of every time, people will say these scientists can do anything. They will just make GMOs and they will feed us with that. Right. But if we can talk in terms of a common man and can spread the message that this is not bad for the society, then we will be able to go ahead. Yeah, I think at least we all people who are from yeah. science fraternity, it's our duty. to at least guide people in the right direction that's my better labeling can be can help it yeah. yeah right so thank you dr khan thank you so much for a very interesting talk and uh, the audience also for generating discussions so thank you very much so thank you the next uh, presentation is from dr akhil agrawal from central university of rajasthan Uh, on microbiological solutions to problems in oil and gas industries. Again, he is a son of the soil with B.Sc. from Bharatpur, Masters from Goa University, and Ph.D. from Delhi, Delhi, and postdoctoral from University of Calgary. We have recently struck a collaboration with University of Calgary at MIT. Uh, I know it's a great place, and it has been. Uh,